Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. All right, so my name is Amethyst Davis. I'm the founder of the Harvey World Herald, which is a hyper-local, black-owned, Gen Z-led newsroom down in Harvey, Illinois, which is in the South Suburbs, which is also my hometown. Um, and today I wanted to, you know, well, actually, thank you to Chicago Hack Night, Shy Hack Night, for inviting me to come out and speak with you all. Um, and today I wanted to, you know, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, this sort of effort we see nationwide to quote unquote save local news. And I want to talk about the work that we're doing in Harvey, which uh, really is about not trying to save local news and why we shouldn't. So um, I'm going to sort of go over, you know, what it's been like to build the Harvey World Herald. Um, I want to talk about Ida B. Wells, who's often considered the godmother of modern day investigative reporting um, and uh, movement journalism uh, specifically, which is a new framework to address some of the contending issues um, that we see in journalism, um, a lot of it dealing with like racism um, and not holding power to account, um, not doing the type of truth telling work we really need to be doing in these newsrooms. And then I want to actually sort of embark on a conversation about uh, what many are dubbing the new black press and what many um, younger uh, newsrooms that are being led by younger black folks um, are doing around not saving local news and where the Harvey World Herald is in with that. So how many of you have ever heard of Harvey by a show of hands? I know you lying. I was expecting... <laughs> So I was expecting nobody to raise their hand. Um, so, you know, Harvey's my hometown. It's down in the south suburbs, for those who don't know. Um, you know, Harvey always tell people, all these communities in suburban Cook County, Harvey is literally the only a place where people would flat out tell you when they leave here and someone asks where you're from, we will tell you, I'm from Harvey. We won't say, oh, I'm from Chicago. And then people say, well, what part? You're like, oh, I mean, it's kind of near the city, but not in the city. No, we will tell you I'm from Harvey. So it's a deep sense of community pride. Um, you know, these pictures I have here, Harvey really is like a, a small town, right? 20, big small town, 20,000 people. Um, it's largely black and brown. At this point, it's a, a lower income community, um, but we the baddest to ever do it. <laughs> it's flat out. Um, so on the left here, you have Harvey's only high school, which is Thornton Township High School, aka Wildcat Country. I have my TTHS mask on, best high school in Illinois State. I don't make the rules. Facts don't lie. People do. Debate your mama. <laughs> Um, and then to the right, you have this really beautiful mural here that my dear friend Amaz Wright did um, called Harvey World Wall. Um, I present these two images to you because if you ever hear about Harvey, these are not the sort of beautiful, gleaming images you're presented with. Um, so in the broader sort of like, you know, frame mentality or consciousness of, of this area, Harvey's really become shorthand for two things, crime and political corruption. Um, you know, so Harvey back in the mid 20th century was known as the gateway to the South suburbs because it was the economic beacon of the South suburbs. So you'll oftentimes he times hear people in the city say that, you know, uh, there was this effort, you know, not to extend the red line past 95th because they didn't want people from, you know, black folks from the city moving to the, to the suburbs. They specifically did not want them moving to the south suburbs. So the thinking was if you were in Chicago, you know, or in this area and you wanted to, you know, move up, you know, in the ladder, you wanted to move to Harvey, right? You know, it was the site of uh, where you could like, you know, access jobs, you know, beautiful homes, um, you know, so everybody wanted to go to Harvey. And, and, you know, if you said you lived in Harvey, people would ask you, man, what do you do for a living? Um, 
mid 20th century, um, Harvey sort of falls victim to what is unfortunately all too common a story um, in many sort of uh, industrial, post-industrial communities and in that deindustrialization comes into the picture. Um, and sort of all of these, you know, uh, major, you know, jobs leave out, uh, manufacturing plants close up. And then you have waves of white flight, right, and agitated by racial and economic segregation in Harvey and in the South suburbs. Um, and so over the decades and in the latter portion of the 20th century, Harvey really takes a steep economic decline. Um, and then all the while, in the background, you have political leaders who are just flippantly corrupt. Um, so across multiple, you know, mayoral administrations, um, you know, you had mayors that were giving people cars because they were their friends or they were, you know, giving folks city owned homes to just have simply because, you know, they were they were cool. Um, you know, people who were on payroll, but who didn't actually work for the city, stuff like that. And so in the really the 21st century, um, Air, Mayor Eric J. Kellogg um, elected in 2003, he really takes corruption in Harvey to, I mean, new heights. Literally just today, his brother, um, Derek Muhammad, who was a lieutenant in the traffic division at Harvey Police Department, was convicted of extorting local tow companies um, in exchange for city contracts because in Harvey, um, towing contracts are through the city. Um, and so, you know, Kellogg, he, I mean, his name is never, um, he's never been convicted for anything but um, it's pretty well understood that he had his hands all in the mix of a lot of these things in Harvey. So when people say Harvey, Illinois, there is pretty much a superficial narrative that comes to many's minds. So I'm, I'm, I saw so many hands go up. You know, I assume no hands would go up, but I also I'm, I'm so curious as to, you know, for the folks who have heard of Harvey, um, what are some of the things that you've heard about Harvey for someone who raised their hand very quickly. Very quickly. Jabuki of white. Jabuki definitely, no, listen, listen. Jabuki is from Harvey and he used to twerk in front of the Walgreens on 147th and Halstead for honey buns. And his brother Javon used to throw hand warmers at him. Jabuki is definitely from Harvey. Um, you know, but, but one of the things that the community you know, has really become frustrated with over the years is, you know, there's so much deep pride in Harvey. I mean, my granny and granddaddy, they were the first black family to integrate um, the block I grew up on of 152nd and Loomis. And my Aunt Mary, my granny's sister, she lives around the corner. And so our family units are really close and I mean, Harvey, you see Thornton here, there are purple and white sidewalks. There are churches painted purple and white. There are businesses painted purple and white. It is a school pride community in every sense. And so it's really frustrating when you kind of see your community painted in a superficial way. Um, that doesn't at the very least do the work of trying to look at some of the larger institutional problems that cause you know corruption and things like you no know, segregation um, to exist and persist in your community. So that's a little about Harvey. Our newsroom's origin story is I hate to use the language of a hero story, but it, because there are no heroes or saviors in any of this, and I'll get to that later. Um, but our newsroom is a pandemic era newsroom. So 2020, um, I was actually in New York City working at a, at a university on the East Coast. COVID hits, and so I decide to come back to Illinois and just check on my people. And so I'm getting off downtown Harvey on the train at the metro station on 154th Street, and I'm presented with, I mean, everything just looked the same. So there are people strung out in the middle of the street, abandoned properties that were, you know, there when I was in high school. They looked no in better shape. Um, and this was just like a dramatically, I think for me, different picture of the pandemic's impact than what I had at first, you know, become accustomed to. Because in New York City, when you went to Times Square, there was literally nobody else around, 
right? Like the pandemic has sort of upended life as we know it and brought in all this despair. But for Harvey, that was business as usual. So when I hopped off the train and saw that I was particularly disturbed because it looked the same as when I had left six years prior. Okay, so I come to 152nd and Loomis. So I actually grew up, uh, you can see my granny's Jeep right there. That's my granny's Jeep. And so there's this, um, that's Mr. Leroy's house, this brown house here, and this white one second to the last. That's the home I grew up on. I grew up in 152nd and Loomis. And I always say that 152nd and Loomis is like one of the most quintessential blocks in the immediate downtown Harvey area. And it's really because of the community, right? You know, my granny and granddaddy were on that block, uh, are on that block. Miss Cooksey was across the street. You know, Miss Tate House was up the block. She was the candy lady. So everybody in the neighborhood eventually found their way to my block growing up. Um, but it hurt as I was rounding the corner because what you don't see here, um, there are two homes on my block. It used to be Sam and Trey's old house. And I forget the, the woman um, next, the old lady next to them, but the homes are literally caving in on themselves. And usually, you know, this is a point where I would put those sorts of images up, but I don't want to leave you with those images, so I didn't put them here. But, you know, they didn't look like that when I left for high school. Um, and so that sort of like was really jaw dropping for me and disturbing. And so I decided to try to figure out what had been happening in Harvey since I had been gone those six years. You know, I, I wanted to know where I could find a COVID-19 test. That didn't really pan out. There wasn't really much information about where to find a COVID-19 test. Um, you know, how to get the, the COVID-19 shot when that became available. Did the city have an outdoor dining program? Um, these things I was trying to get answers to and I really couldn't. And so in the process of me trying to sort of catch up um, with what was happening in Harvey, it sort of clicked that for someone like myself who, you know, worked in an environment in which I was tasked with getting information, getting it quickly, um, being able to sort of like disseminate that to students, faculty, whomever came to me for whatever issue they had that day, because I always tell people it was my job, do everybody else's job. Um, you know, that if it was hard for me, especially as someone who also has a bit of a policy research background, to find out what was happening in Harvey, the situation had to be much more pronounced for someone who was formerly incarcerated, coming home, trying to just figure out how to get their state ID or you know, reacclimate to the community. The situation had to be much more pronounced for a single mother trying to raise three kids by herself and figure out how to navigate that all alone. And so I decided to, as a then 24 year old who thought she knew everything, I decided to quit my job in New York City and move back to Illinois and build that very thing to help us all. So I decided to build a newsroom in Harvey from the ground up. Now, mind you, Harvey did not have a newsroom for about 30, 40 years. Um, so I grew up in a news desert. Um, the papers, the Harvey Star Tribune, the Harvey News B, they had gone under um, several decades ago. And so I'm, I'm also, you know, again, 24. I think I know everything. Um, you know, I'm also tasking myself with trying to really take on this sort of uh, like the news desert crisis that we often hear about in this country. Um, but I did not want to replicate the wheel. Like I know that people, you know, in Harvey, we hate looking up on the TV screens, you know, um, and seeing Harvey yet again on Chicago's TV news. For just yesterday, we had like an entire lot of semi trucks catch fire. So that's a thing. It's stuff like that, you know. Uh, but you want to look up and you want to see positive images about your community as well. You want conversations about policy. 
right? You want conversations about the sort of institutions and the political institutions in your community and how they're structured. Um, you want dialogue. You want solutions-oriented, you know, conversations. You want to bring people together to actually take action in your community. This is, like, these are things about Harvey, like, natives through and through. We are not, I'm just about to sit here and mope a type of people. We are very, okay, here's a problem. I'm going to be direct about it. I'm about to get up and do something about it type of people, right? So how could we build a newsroom in the community, but also build it in a way that actually works for the public, um, being very realistic about the deep-seated racism and sexism and classism, insert literally every other ism here, about journalism and about how that has shown up um, in our own community. And so the Harvey World Herald, um, last January we launched, we, I launched this newsroom as a one-person operation. I don't actually have a J school background. So I do not come from a traditional sort of journalism training. And I think in many ways that's actually the benefit. Um, I used to see it as a disadvantage, but I think not having, not coming in with any type of, you know, preconceived ideas about what journalism is or really what it should be has been to my benefit um, and really been to the community's benefit and trying to see the community as a partner as opposed to an other in building this newsroom, which is why our tagline is building the news together. And so in the now two years that we've been up um, or coming up, you know, I've been doing a lot of reflecting about this work in the time since. Um, so in April, we were the first newsroom in generations to cover the municipal races. In that, I mean, till this day, we still get, you know, compliments about our coverage, right? We were able to do deep campaign finance research into the mayoral race. Um, we were able to put together an election center so people had access to polling locations and voter registration information. And we also looked at some of the key issues that were driving the race, like business and economic development, like... Um, you know, crime, and there's a whole, there was a whole politics um, to the rhetoric that candidates were using around that. But, you know, one of the things that I really haven't, I don't think, had the time to really sit with, um, and just so you all know, I'm the only full-time staff member at the Harvey World Herald. So last year it was a one-person operation, now it's myself and over a dozen freelancers. Right, so I really haven't had, I think, the time to really sit down until now, the end of the year, right, to think about the Harvey World Herald and the sort of larger history of the black press in this country and where we are within this conversation um, about the black American struggle toward actualizing democracy and so as I've, as I've been trying to, you know, sit with a lot of that as of late, I've been thinking about how for black people in this country, we've always been several standard deviations away from democracy, right? So the Daily Record um, was a black owned newspaper down in Wilmington, North Carolina, in, in a uh, massacre, race riot um, in the late 1800s. A white mob burned down the newsroom. And this is the image you see here presented in front of you. This is a white mob taking a picture of themselves in front of the destruction of uh, one of, uh, what was that, you know, one of America's first black owned newspapers, right? And so I look at this and I think about, you know, what it's like to. At this particular not time, not even be able to access the right to vote, right? But to know that a free press is supposed to be the cornerstone of a democracy, and you literally see it get burned down right in front of your eyes, right? If, if black people, if we could not have the right to vote, in many communities, we had local newspapers, right? And I'm thinking about folks like Ida B. Wales, a civil rights icon who was actually here in Chicago on the South Side uh, for some time. 
her reporting, she's considered the godmother of modern day investigative journalism. Um, and so much of her work was actually about things like this to the left. It was about white mobs senselessly attacking um, black communities. And, and to be more specific, it was about the, the lynchings taking place in the South, right? And I think about how bold and audacious Ida B. Wells had to have been at a time like this, doing this work, knowing this could have gotten you killed, right? This sort of truth telling that you were not supposed to be doing, right? Um, and I think about what role the Harvey World Herald, what role other you know, black owned uh, and managed in black centered newsrooms today have to be doing to sort of live up to the legacies of folks like Ida B. Wells and to carry that torch. And I think about things like movement journalism, um, which is this emerging framework um, that we see in journalism or, you know, that really is nothing like how we've ever really operated. I think journalism traditionally, especially um, you know, sort of capital J journalism, is very profit driven. Um, we say that it, we hold you know power to account, when in reality we kind of sidestep power. Right? We, we seek buy-in from the very um, institutions that we're supposed to check. Right. So a good example of this. Um, you know, um, in, in Harvey, I actually had someone, a reporter in Chicago, I was telling them about some of the uh, accountability work we're trying to do regarding Harvey Police Department. And then they asked me, have you interviewed the chief yet? And I said, no. And they were like, why not? And I'm like, well, because they're cops. They don't want to speak to the reporters. You know, and then I also had mentioned, I said, and, you know, and we also are investigating them. Um, you know, for trying to vet some allegations of uh, police brutality and misconduct in Harvey. So that's probably another reason why they don't want to speak with us. And, you know, their response to me was, you know, well, here's what you do. Sometimes, you know, when you try to reach out to someone, you won't tell them what it is you're really trying to get at, but you sort of be nice with them, sort of play it safe. So you get that interview with them now, and you know, don't so, so you sort of sidestep the very things, the real issues you want to talk about, so you can actually get the buy-in with them. And so, you know, for me, what that came off as was, so I I'm supposed to really sit here as a reporter, knowing that this is someone who has these allegations against them, and buddy up to them and cozy up to them instead of doing my job. For what? For what? What's the point, right? Imagine if reporters, for that type of grace, if you want to call it that, imagine if reporters were actually taught that the same level, like the fervor with which we try to build relationships with the very people we're supposed to hold to account, imagine if we actually applied that same energy to the very communities that want us to serve them and want us to work with them. Right. So imagine if a reporter, instead of doing what this person had advised me to do, applied that same energy to trying to build relationships with people who've been directly impacted by violence, including police violence, in these communities. I'm pretty sure people would prefer that as opposed to shucking and jabbing for cops. Right. And so movement journalism, movement journalism looks at things like that. Right and says that we should be rejecting this sort of style of journalism that says that we should be up trying to appease power, right? Movement journalism really rejects objectivity, the idea that uh, reporters are sort of at a distance from the community um, and treating the community as an other. And really what movement, movement journalism posits is that, you know, we have not really done the level of truth telling that we need because we're too busy trying to play both sides ism, right? Like, you know, <laughs> you don't you don't both sides ism white supremacy. You don't both sides ism racism, right? Like, you know, um, I think you don't both sides ism like lies. Like if, if a politician lies, you should say that they lied. Um, these are things that we are not eager to do. 
And I think it's partly because we are trying to maintain the sort of idea um, that we don't sit in these newsrooms and actually take the time to really make decisions about the narratives that we make and the type of coverage that we push because we know that we do. Um, movement journalism is also very collaborative and it is rooted in people power. So I think about really great example of this. City Bureau here in Chicago, the documenters program, right? I actually did some time with documenters. Um, that is collaborative people power, right? They are equipping everyday folks to actually uh, go out into the community, the documenters program, take notes and contribute that to a public database and try to build a multiracial democracy, right? There's no, there's no savior complex. There are no individual heroes, right? Traditional journalism teaches us that there's a star reporter in the newsroom, that the go-to for certain issues, and movement journalism is really grounded in this sort of egalitarian, you know, horizontal leadership, right? That we are not trying to um, be one person who's standing out in front, pulling everyone be else behind us, but rather we are kind of, you know, we're side by side trying to pull one another. Right, so it's very, it's very rooted in um, collaboration, and it's also grounded in trying to reduce harm. And I feel like, you know, in a place like Harvey, right, where we easily could be replicating the wheel, um, you know, the Harvey World Herald has never been responsible, or we, we know, prior to our existence, you know, we were not the cause of why so many black and brown people and Harvey distrust the media or distrust journalists. That predates us. But if we want to actually build this operation with the community, we, we do need to acknowledge that there's harm done and actually position ourselves to work toward repairing it, right, and moving forward. So even though we, have may, we may or may not have been responsible for a lot of these things, we still take responsibility and we're actually rep doing like the reparations work, okay? And lastly, a really good point about, a really key point about movement journalism is that it asks how, why, and I think most importantly, and, right? How is something occurring in a community, right? So if I, if I look at D-Ray just shot Deshaun, right? That's gun violence, okay? Why is it occurring, right? Movement journalism says that we need to actually take a look at structural issues and systemic forces as opposed to laying blame on individual actors. I think that is one of like the best parts about movement journalism is that it demands you actually think on a structural level. But above all else, it also demands and, right, more, um, which is to say, I think, solutions. Right, one of the key components of, of movement journalism is that it's not just grounded in, oh my gosh, gloom and doom, but actually tries to think about what are policies, what are systems that could actually work to prevent these issues from occurring again. Um, and I think that is the most, I think for me, um, personally, the most touching part, right? Because I'm just not even, I think, again, being from Harvey, I'm not somebody who just wants problems presented to me all day. Remember, Harvey, we're go-getters. So let's talk about all the problems in the community, but please, let's talk about what we are going to do to fix it. That is my energy, and that is how my community moves. And if you want to read more about movement journalism, there's this really great book um, called The View from Somewhere by Lewis Raven Wallace, and it is really considered like the, one of the most uh, seminal texts in trying to understand movement journalism, which is still actually fairly new in this space. It's only been something that's in our lexicon um, for about five or six years or so, so 2016, 2017. And it actually emerged in the South. Um, journalists in the South were concerned with building new frameworks um, to at tackle challenges in journalism today. I look at the Harvey World Herald. And I actually think that for myself, as someone who, I mean, I didn't go to J school, you know, I did documenters, 
Um, as someone who decided to be bold and audacious and try to build a newsroom from the ground up and they have like no business background on top of everything else, um, I've, I've needed some type of a framework. I've needed a, a sort of North Star. I've needed something to guide me to do this work. But I've also needed community. And so I've actually found that as a founder um, with other newsrooms um, across America that are themselves in some way grounded in movement journalism explicitly or still apply movement journalistic principles to their work. And so I think what you know differentiates the Harvey World Herald and you know Baltimore Beat, um, the Tribe here in Chicago, which I really admire, our newsrooms from our predecessors. Um, we are inspired by the militarism of, of folks like Ida B. Wales. That is definitely, you know, in the wheelhouse. I don't want people to get the impression that um, a younger generation of journalists is dismissing those who've come before them, which I think is oftentimes the sort of impression we give about young people doing any type of a work. Um, I think the new, the newer generation of uh, Black-owned newsrooms is, is very... We, help, we hold in high regard um, our predecessors and our ancestors. Um, but we are challenged by you know, different forces that our um, that old legacy newsrooms really had not been before. I think specifically by things like technology, right? The technological advancements, um, social media. I think you having to adjust to social media, um, and you know, you're living in or serving a community like Harvey with deep digital divides, um, you know, pervasive misinformation and disinformation, um, news literacy issues. I think that our you know generation of reporters were being challenged by things that legacy publications um, had not been before. But I also think that we differ from them. And that while we recognize, as they do, that the house is on fire, right, I don't think we're as eager to go try to save the house. Like, I think many of us see the house on fire and we just like, I right, let it burn. Let it burn. And then we'll go build a new house. I think the new black press is focused on building new houses, right, um, and using things like movement journalism as a possible framework, one of many frameworks, for trying to figure out how we take this institution um, and sort of reimagine it for our communities and reimagine its impact um, and what it can do to sort of bring us together and tether us um, against these largest forces that attempt to tear us apart. But there are challenges. The challenges are garbage. Um, you know, I could riff, I mean, there's, I mean, there's plenty of things that we are all reckoning with. Um, I think one of the biggest things is the change in like the finance models. Um, like in Chicago, there's been a, in the area a very explicit shift toward nonprofit journalism and that has a lot of benefits. Um, but then we also deal with sort of like the nonprofit industrial complex, you know, um, and you know, our newsroom, you know, is largely grant funded. Right, which we kind of need because when a third of the community lives at or below the poverty line, it makes something like being 70, 60, 70 percent reader revenue like WBZ kind of just out of the picture. You know, um, when you serve a, a real small town of 20,000 people where everybody knows everybody and advertising dollars historically have always had this sort of pressure on newsrooms to not tell certain stories. It becomes increasingly hard to, you know, really, you know, leverage advertising dollars in, in a small town. And so you have to think about that in a much more regional scale. Um, there are definitely financial challenges, but I think what a lot of black newsrooms, a younger generation of black reporters are really talking about is the blog sites and like the misinformation and disinformation heads, the talking heads on the internet. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the shade room? By a show of hands, it's the it's the TMZ of Instagram. No, 
No? Okay, a couple of y'all, yeah. So the Shade Room and Say Cheese, um, Vlad TV, I'm going to get on him last. But these are, you know, sort of social media like sites that where there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation spread. The target audience, you can just tell, is black people, though. I don't even think that some, I know Shade Room is led by black folks. I don't think Say Cheese is led by black people. And I know Vlad TV ain't led by black people. Um, but they are geared toward folks, right, who are rightfully disaffected with mainstream media. One. Two, they do want to know what's happening in the world around them. And three, these clowns have just found an audience, right? And so there are many people who I think when they look at, you know, their family members or their cousins or whomever on the Internet sort of um, reposting things that are grossly misleading, I think it's real easy to shame them. Um, but I think, you know, younger generations of reporters, I think we actually look at this. Uh, we look at those folks and um, who are posting these things, reposting these things. And I don't think we are looking to shame them. I don't, I don't feel as though the conversations I sit in on and, and participate in are rooted in shame culture, but I, I think that they are really rooted in trying to humanize these people and recognize that they are victims, right? These are people, again, who they don't trust the mainstream media. There's a lot of damage and harm there. And they do want to know what's happening in their community and the world around them. And these people... Vlad TV, Say Cheese, they just found the audience when so many other newsrooms would not go reach these communities. The, the folks who are spreading misinformation and disinformation did, right? But it's still a big challenge nonetheless, right? Because you have to sort of, you have to not yuck somebody's yum while still yucking their yum. <laughs> so it's, it's hard. It's hard. Um, but I think that in many ways we are living up to the task. I think movement journalism, like I said, it's, I don't think it's the framework for trying to do things like build newsrooms that actually work for the public good or really be concerned with building new institutions that work for the public good. I don't think it's the only way of trying to solve America's news desert crisis and building, um, you know, a, effectively sort of trying to use a clean slate to build newsrooms that people actually can trust, that, people, that make people run toward the things happening in their community as opposed to running away from them. Um, but I think that the new black press has really embraced movement journalism as a way of building these new homes. Um, I look at the tribe here in Chicago, shout out to, maybe they're going to see it, maybe not, shout out to um, Tiffany Walden um, and Morgan Johnson over there. They actually produced uh, the revolutionary column. Um, which is, I think, one of the grassroots organizers here actually had been writing about things like, um, you know, pitfalls of criminal justice, you know, in the Lori Lightfoot campaign and sort of rethinking the, the tenure of Kim Fox, right, um, and sort of taking, you know, a really, I mean, a really hard punch up at a lot of the mainstream uh, crime and, and violence coverage you see here in Chicago. I think about the Kansas City Defender, I really admire them so much. Um, Ryan Sorrell launched Kansas City Defender, um, and it is like the Harvey World Herald, Gen Z led. But I think what the Kansas City Defender has done a great job of is making the argument that young black people can be reached. Um, you just really have to make the news sort of, you really have to present the news information in the way that they actually dig. And they, they've actually built out much of their following through social media, right? Which people often regard as the only side of misinformation and disinformation, which I think is contestable. Um, but they've made the case that you actually, that newsrooms can be using things like social media to reach um, Gen Zers, um, to reach you know, black people. I think about... 
they had a story. They actually broke the story that there was someone in Kansas City um, kidnapping black women and locking them up in homes in the basement. And like Kansas City PD was like, that's not true. We haven't received anything. And so like there were a lot of mainstream newsrooms that blasted them for reporting this out. And then like two weeks later, a woman, she escaped from a basement and was like, some dude had me chained up. And they were right. Um, you know, this this newsroom did not do what Ryan calls, which is, um, you know, he says newsrooms usually act as stenographers for the police. We usually just regurgitate everything, copy pasta, I'll call it copy pasta, copy pasta. We usually just regurgitate whatever they tell us to. Because in Jay's school, you're not taught to fact check the police. And so I really admire the Kansas City Defender because they, they actually stood 10 toes down at not, you know, blatantly, um, you know, just at first glance, regurgitating a police narrative, and they were all actually able to hold them to account about um, the fact that they missed this, and then told them it didn't even exist. I look at MLK 50 Memphis, which um, is a black woman owned specifically operation down south. Um, they are focused on really, I think, workers' justice and looking at issues of power and policy. I admire them greatly. I was recently in conversation with Wendy Thomas, who is the uh, founder of MLK 50, and she's someone who, um, you know, I, I think about making the case to funders, right, to, to philanthropists, um, who now want to pump more money into journalism because they see it as a public good. Um, she is one of those folks who is really, I think, behind the scenes trying to push, you know, funders in a way that makes it easier for um, younger generations like ours um, to emerge. She, she, I, I consider MLK 50 Mem Memphis a part of the new black press. Wendy is a little bit um, older than me, you know, older than the rest of us, but she is, is paving the way for um, newsrooms that are maybe two or three years you know, behind it. Um, and then Scalawag is in the South. Uh, you know, the South is the Ruta to the Tuta. Um, Scalawag is actually you know, talking about things like police and prison abolition um, and talking about some of the failures of capitalism. Um, movement journalism doesn't mean that we are sound boxes for activists or for grassroots organizers, but I think that movement journalism means that you know reporters of the new black press are much more open to taking seriously a lot of the rhetoric and um, you know policy prescriptions that people in these grassroots organizing spaces are proposing. So what does this all look like for us, right? For the Harvey World Herald. Um, one of the things that I always say about our newsroom is that we are trying to build something that is built by, for, and with the community, right? Having people who are from the community, from Harvey, Illinois, like myself, actually be able to take back our community's narrative, um, you know, not being necessarily paternalistic um, and thinking that we, because we're building this type of an apparatus, that makes us the uh, arbiters of you know um, what is and is not legitimate in the community. I, I think that we embrace this idea um, that there are multiple ways of looking at something. Um, there are multiple information systems in Harvey, right? So even though Harvey did not have a newsroom, Harvey still had churches. Harvey got a church on like every other block. Right, Harvey still got churches. Harvey's, um, you know, the communities always had like parent teachers associations. They've had student groups, right? These are also, I think, for the you know legacy black newsrooms. These are the types of spaces we had outright embraced against this larger backdrop of an institution and an industry that sort of told us that these spaces were not legitimate, that these voices were not legitimate. And so we have done this work of trying to make sure we recognize and affirm those spaces in the conversations we have with residents and how we um, approach our reporting. I do not like to use the, like this language of we've discovered X or you know we've unpacked Y because if somebody else came to you with a tip, 
talking about a story that sent you off on your way, baby. You wasn't the first one to get it done, you feel me? Um, but I also think that we are trying to become a conduit, right? Um, we, I did a survey about two years ago, right before I got back to Illinois. And I had asked people all sorts of stuff. You know, where do you get information? Um, you know, what's your own little background being from Harvey? Um, one of the things I asked people was, who would you like to meet? And so, I mean, there were so many different responses. You know, you have folks, I had a teacher, you know, she's worked in Harvey schools for like 20 years. And she was like, I want to meet other parents who was just as dedicated to actually doing right by these kids as I am. And then I had someone who they um, think they're just a resident who's like, you know what? I hate our bandos in Harvey. We call abandoned properties bandos. I'm not sure what they call them in the city, but... You know, they were like, I hate the bandos. I want to work with other people who want to rehabilitate abandoned properties in Harvey. And someone else was like, you know what? I really am big on the environment and sustainability, and I just want Harvey to be more walkable. And I want more people in Harvey who also care about the environment to, you know, I want to be talking with them about these different things and figure out how we can make Harvey more green, right? People in Harvey want to build relationships. They want to get to know their neighbors. When you live in a community, when you've been told, right, that all y'all are dirt, all y'all are trash, it makes it innately harder to do something like mutual aid. You can't do mutual aid if you don't trust your next door neighbor, right? Um, you know, if a global pandemic hits, you don't want to go door to door and actually, you know, use that as an opportunity to draw closer as opposed to tether, you know, to detether yourselves, right? Um, if you've been told that they were, these were people off rip needed to fear. So the question for me and the, and the sort of role that I have is I ask myself, how can the Harvey World Herald act as a conduit? How can we take all these different pre-existing information systems in the community and try to bring them together to create some type of cohesion and build a civic infrastructure, right? Um, and so the language I always use is that the Harvey World Herald is really a tiny part of a very big collective vision. Again, there are no heroes in this. There are no savior complexes in this. And the Harvey World Herald doesn't want to become an entity in the community that positions itself as such, right? And in that, we're concerned with an ecosystem and trying to create abundance, right? If you think about communities that thrive, it's not just about meeting their basic needs. They live in abundance, right? And so how do we create this type of free-flowing information? How do we bring people together uh, against the very forces that, that attempt to uh, rip them apart? And so we actually now um, are part of a forthcoming, pardon me, a forthcoming um, local news collaborative in the South Suburbs called the Local News Alliance that is actually going to be working around lots of these things. Um, there are other new small publishers in the South Suburbs that have been up for longer than the Harvey World Herald, and they've just struggled to grow. But they care just as much as, as I do about our respective communities. So this is like Harvey and Homewood and Flossmoor. I think Park Forest is in the mix. We got Olympia Fields in the mix. Um, and we're trying to figure out how is it that we just do our jobs? How do we literally just, how do we build an entire information ecosystem in a region that is chock full of news deserts? How do we do the work that we've been doing on a much grander scale? How do we collaborate with one another? Is that reporting projects? Is it fundraising? Um, is it you know, you know, you leveraging our respective networks to you know, deepen relationships with funders um, to get money? Is that a pooled fund? Do we have this thing operate as a fiscal sponsor? How do we do this? The bottom line is we all give a damn. And a lot of, industry, a lot of newsrooms in this industry and reporters do not. But at the center of it all, at the center of that, that effort that you will see in the South Suburbs, 
is the new black press. The new black press serving the capital city of the South suburbs is going to be helping to ground that effort and possibly become a national model for how we tackle the news desert crisis and reimagine journalism in America. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, wait. All right, so I tweaked. I tweaked. Um, the response, because there has been that, um, it's been overwhelmingly positive since we launched in Harvey. Um, everybody and their mama reads the Harvey World Herald. I'm talking like school teachers. I know high schoolers who read. We got middle schoolers who read. Um, we have pastors who read. The mayor, he'll sit up and tell you he don't read the Harvey World Herald. His, the people who work in the mayor's office tell that man read every single story <laughs> that goes up on harveyworld.org. Um, he refuses to interview with us at this point because they also tell me he is afraid of us. And I think that's a compliment. I think it's a compliment. Um, but it's just been overwhelmingly positive, um, the sort of response that we've gotten. You know, it's definitely not easy um, trying to build a newsroom and, and trying to really tell people um, that, like, hey, we, we recognize that this is a community of, of broken promises and hidden agendas, and we are actually trying to not sort of, you know, re uh, open that wound. Um, but for the most part, people in Harvey, you know, 20-somethings to seniors, they've been very receptive to the work that we've been doing. Um, and it's only up from her. Now, thank you. Um, thank you so much. This is incredible. I guess one question is, how do you potentially relate to, like, the Chicago news ecosystem and like the we've heard at Chi Hack Night from the Independent Media Alliance in Chicago and like just curious like do you feel like related to the the Chicago kind of city news ecosystem or, or and how do you yeah like how do you feel about connecting with that? Um in some ways I do in some ways I don't. So in the ways that I do, I mean I came out of Chicago documenter, you know what I'm saying, it's a program. So I definitely have relationships and ties there. Um it has been nothing short of amazing the type of uh, support um, that some of the like you know local hyper local like nonprofit outlets have extended to our newsroom. Um, speaking of Chicago Independent Media Alliance, speaking of SEMA, those I mean when I got back and I was trying to figure out like where our support systems right now I could be tapping into, we could be tapping into and leveraging. SEMA was one of the immediate ones I, I found. And I think we've definitely been the beneficiaries of those resources, namely the big fundraising campaign they do um, and getting being able to actually learn how to run those types of um, things and trying to figure out where those revenue streams fit within the, within the larger business model. Um, in some ways, I don't see us kind of fitting into the Chicago system only because we're in the South suburbs, but it's also like this very uncomfortable and awkward dynamic in that a lot of these reporters in these, in these newsrooms, they did damage in our community and they've never acknowledged it. So it's really sometimes uncomfortable to walk into these rooms and spaces with, with people who just do unremitted, you know, violence in your community and have absolutely, you know, one of the things I always say is that like journalists are like politicians and police and that they get to, you know, we get to sort of like do harm and are never held to account for it. Um, and so it's just really awkward to sort of also, you know, and frustrating to be around people who everybody and their mama knows that the coverage of Harvey and of South Suburban communities by Chicago media has been racist, um, has been classist and elitist. But you ask any one of them about it, all of a sudden nobody knows about it. And that's just really frustrating and annoying. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. It was incredibly inspiring and informative. My question is, I love at the beginning how you talked about Harvey and most people's, if they've heard of it, the representations of Harvey and how part of the mission of the Harvey world is to showcase more positive depictions. I would just love to hear you talk a little bit more about that in terms of your coverage, mm -hmm. how you guys have navigated that, if you found like ways to showcase um, more positive things, like how you balance that with things that are happening in the community that are newsworthy but are not as positive. Yeah. Just, yeah, I'm very curious. 
Absolutely. So one of the greatest things about Harvey is that it has always had a thriving arts culture and entertainment scene. So, you know, you mentioned Jabuki. Right. So, yeah, Kiki, Kiki Palmer, she was born. She's actually from Robin. She's from Mudville. They will tear your behind up. You say she's from Harvey. But she's, she was born in Harvey, though. She was born in Harvey. Uh, she was raised, you know, in, in nearby in Mudville and Robbins. Um, you know, but you look at her, you look at um, just earlier today or earlier, but on my way here, or, you know, I was coming out of the metro station and Shirt by SZA was playing. Rob Geringer, who's a Harvey native, he co-produced that with Dark Child. He's played the Super Bowl multiple times. You know, um, if you look at Thornton, the city's only high school, um, back in like the 80s, it was the number one speech and drama program in the state. Um, and Thornton, Harvey has always had this history of a rich uh, speech and drama scene. The first black full-time um, cast member, openly queer woman, on Saturday Night Live, Denitra Vance, she went to Thornton. And so there's always been this rich um, artistic energy um, in you know, st- uh, speech and drama, but also in music. Um, I always tell people that Harvey is the hip hop capital of suburban Cook County. Um, we truly are. And we've, all, we've had this history of just a rich jazz band tradition. Back in like the 70s and 80s, the most popular thing you could do in Harvey was be a band kid. That is not normal. <laughs> it's just not normal, right? Like it's very unique. And it, these are things that the community is deeply aware of and proud of. And so anytime we can actually tap into that energy, uh, which we've been doing very explicitly, we've been highlighting local musicians and producers. Um, we cover the school plays. You know, those performances, the spring play, you know, um, that has been like youth performing arts. That has been really, I think, the point where we've really been able to showcase to the community that we're serious about making sure we have positive images about the things that have always been here in Harvey, this energy that's always been here. That's, I think, a point where we've been able to tap into that energy and sort of tell, really affirm to the community we are here to, to make sure we have affirming energy uh, images as well. Um, but we also are trying to do this um, work of bringing policy to the community and reporting on things like school infrastructure and reporting on um, climate change issues in the South suburbs. Um, and so I, I think even, even when those things aren't so lighthearted, um, I think there is... Uh, uh, if you if you read our reporting, there's a deep level of care, of detail, and of rigor in the conversation that people in Harvey are not used to. That because they're presented with it, along with these positive images, it just clicks. It just clicks. Um, so you mentioned the black. So you mentioned the black press, and I, and I, so I'm thinking, of, of course, you know, the Defender and and. Um, that bygone era of of movement radical jur- journalism that really kind of centered the community mm-hmm. in a positive light, and um, those entities, do you eventually see yourself kind of partnering, being able to partner with them, or working with them, or are or are we or is the community kind of like, yeah. You just kind of where where, you, where do you sit with that? Yeah. So the question being, like, you know, uh, do we see ourselves partnering with like legacy black publishers around here? Yeah. So no, this is a really great question. Um, there are things that you know these newspapers can do that like we just can't in the digital space. Like we actually in Harvey, a lot of the residents want us to produce a physical newspaper. We are currently digital only, but there are deep technical, uh, technological divides, and the seniors don't really want to have a digital presence, which I totally respect, right? They just don't want it. Um, and so, but they're also the most active voting block in Harvey, and a lot of the politicians know it, and they take advantage of the seniors because they know they're not tapped into what's really happening in the community. And so, we are going to have to some point. Um, embrace a print publication. And so I'm really looking toward alternative weeklies like The Reader and you know, Southside Weekly, but also looking toward, you know, the Chicago, De- or well, actually the Defenders is no longer print. But I think the Crusader 
if I'm not mistaken, the crusade is still praying. Right, right. So I'm looking toward, you know, our, our predecessors for assistance with that because I don't even have a print background. Like that's an entirely different ball game, not just in the production and the operating costs, but definitely in the distribution process. And so I'm actually going to be looking toward um, legacy black news publishers, not just here in Chicago, but also across the country for assistance with trying to produce a print news publication. Cool, I think those are all of our questions. Thank you so much.